Good morning, everyone. Um, let me get that first thing right. I think most times I get it wrong. I say good afternoon when it should be morning. But good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this Swedish Chamber of Commerce event uh, where we essentially count down uh, the days um, uh, for Britain's exit uh, from the European Union. Uh, I think Brits and Europeans and Swedes alike uh, um, are anxiously awaiting the outcome of the now long going uh, trade deal negotiations uh, and we all follow the news closely. And let me tell you, the 1st of January is only 77 days away now. But if you think nothing can happen in 77 days, that could make a difference. Uh, let me also tell you that it's only 19 days until the US presidential election. So things can still happen. Uh, businesses are naturally at the heart of what uh, is going on in uh, Brussels and London uh, today as well, beyond politics. Uh, businesses will have to deal with the outcome and in the end consumers uh, on both sides uh, of the channel will have to deal with the effects of a no deal or a trade deal or a some deal um, uh, situation. Uh, from our end at the Swedish Chamber of Commerce, We've always stood by the, uh, the referendum uh, outcome, but I don't think it's a secret that if you would poll uh, businesses at large, uh, that they would prefer as close a relationship as possible with the UK and dare I say, a trade deal over no deal. Um, we've hosted numerous um, gatherings over the years with businesses on the state of the negotiations, the impact of Brexit or, and specific trade deals uh, uh, and the impact that it will have on different sectors. But today we're going slightly bigger, if you wish. Uh, it's crunch time for real now. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this morning's event is divided into three parts, really. The first one being a discussion on the state of the negotiations and what's gonna happen in Brussels today and where are we going from here. Uh, the second part uh, is really a, a catch up with a couple of Swedish businesses um, uh, about their preparations, what have they done to prepare? And we meet one of Sweden's biggest businesses and then a Swedish UK business, a Scandinavian UK business, uh, a smaller entrepreneurial outfit. Um, lastly, there's a, a, a last minute Q&A and shop, we call it, with uh, customs, tax establishment and immigration experts. A chance for you to ask those questions that you may not um, uh, already have found an answer to, or maybe you haven't asked that question yet. So take that opportunity and I should say that those experts will also stay on after uh, the webinar so that you can ask uh, questions in a more intimate setting if you'd like. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Most of you are very familiar, I think, with the Swedish Chamber of Commerce and the business platform which we provide. But if you're not, and for the benefit of those who don't know, we were founded in 1906 by business, for business, and today we represent some 400 corporate members. The very core, I think, uh, of the Swedish-British business community. Uh, this makes us the largest Swedish chamber in the world uh, and the third largest foreign chamber in London, which we're proud of, but also sort of cements the importance, I think, of the Swedish-British business uh, relationship, uh, not the least to Sweden, but also to the UK. Um, the event today is supposed to be interactive. Uh, uh, we ask you to participate actively and ask questions, share your experiences, uh, however, there are still housekeeping rules to abide by. So if I could ask for that slide, please, uh, Nelly. Could I have the housekeeping slides, please? There you go. So you will have noticed that you are automatically muted and your camera turned off during the webinar. Uh, if you do have a question, which we hope that you do, uh, um, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and uh, we will um, uh, get back to you if your question is being raised or if you'd like you to post it yourself. Uh, if you experience technical issues, please use the chat function and speak to one of the SEC team members who will try to help you. Uh, and just for clarity, please note that this webinar will be recorded and will be made available for members uh, on demand. Now, um, lastly, I'd like to say a special thanks to our sponsors today. Uh, these events don't happen by themselves, uh, but from our point of view, they're almost always a partnership with members or fellow organizations, as is the case today. So I want to say a special thanks to the Swedish Embassy, and we are very honest to be joined by His Excellency, the Swedish Ambassador, uh, um, who will speak shortly. Uh, thanks to KGH Customs, 
uh, Customs Advisors and TMF Group. It's really a, a great um, first uh, shot for expanding globally. Uh, I also want to thank our fellow partner Chambers uh, of Commerce for partnering with us today. Now, I'd like to hand over to Joe Mates, uh, who is UK government uh, reporter and a bit of a Brexit expert at Bloomberg News. Uh, he has a history at the Times in Al Jazeera and has kindly uh, offered to be our master of ceremonies for today's event. So on that note, Joe, uh, I gladly hand over to you and thanks everyone for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, Peter, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to act as your Master of Ceremonies for today's webinar about Brexit. Uh, as Peter said, we're going to have three exciting panels about the political status, the negotiations, we're going to talk about business preparations, and there'll be an opportunity for you to ask some specific questions of our experts about Brexit. Uh, but before that, we're going to have a keynote from the Swedish ambassador to the UK, Torbjorn Solström. So I will happily hand it over to Torbjorn right now. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I don't intend to make any sort of major keynote. I just want to say a big uh, thank you to all of you, and in particular to uh, Peter and the Chamber for doing this. Uh, we are, um, again, I suppose, uh, uh, go approaching a, an incredibly important moment in this uh, 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 long process. Uh, politically, of course, the UK has already left the European Union uh, uh, early this year, uh, but um, uh, I think at, it's only now uh, at New Year or, or in the next year that the practical implications uh, of that departure uh, will be uh, felt. Uh, we, uh, I think preparing, because this uh, event is about preparing for, for uh, what comes after Brexit, um, it's, uh, I suppose a little bit like taking your family for a holiday in Sweden. You don't actually know what sort of weather it will be. So you will have to pack your bag for, for sunny weather and you will have to bring in the rain jacket uh, uh, as well. And I think it's been like this throughout the, uh, the, the uh, process of the UK's departure. We don't know exactly uh, what sort of weather we are heading into. And I think it is exact, it's unfortunately, it is still the same. Uh, businesses will have to prepare for different scenarios, for deal, for no deal, uh, and for different kinds uh, uh, of deals. I think you're all following uh, uh, through the press and, 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 and through experts uh, what is happening. We've made, I think it's fair to say, significant progress in the negotiations on the future relationships. There are a number of outstanding issues still there. Uh, among those uh, prominently, the questions of, of level playing field, the question of fisheries, you, the question of the structure of a, of a future uh, agreement. And it may turn out that one or the other of these issues becomes uh, too difficult uh, to resolve in time. I think from my side, personally, I am, um, I'm still optimistic. Um, um, it may be that I'm wrong, but to me, and I think to the Swedish government, none of these outstanding issues should uh, be uh, impossible to, to resolve. It would seem to us that given the stakes here, given the importance of finding an agreement on the future relationship, both for, for the European Union and for, for the United Kingdom, Kingdoms, we should be able to to uh, to resolve these things, and this has been, as 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 you who represent Swedish businesses, as you know, this has been our approach from the very beginning uh, of of this exercise. We would like the relationship to be uh, as close as possible uh, uh, between the EU and and the UK. We regretted the outcome of the referendum, but here we are, uh, and now when we are looking at what sort of re relationship will replace that, we would like that relationship to be as close as possible, not least because of the very, very uh, strong business relationships that, uh, that we have, and not only in one or, or another sector, like it is the case for some EU member states, we have a very, very rich and diverse uh, business relationship, and we can't focus just on one issue in, in, in terms of the, uh, the, our future partnership. We need uh, across the board uh, to find a way to cooperate as closely uh, as possible. And that's what we have been working uh, 
uh, for throughout these negotiations, and we will continue uh, uh, to uh, do so also in the future. I think I'll stop there. I listen uh, with interest to what you have to say, and I'm ready to, uh, if I can, to answer some questions. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tobiel, for that introduction. And um, let me now move to our first panel, which is going to be a deep dive into the state of the ongoing negotiations and what it means for the future relationship. Allow me to introduce our panellists. We have Christian Danielson, the Head of Representation for Sweden at the European Commission. Anna Canestius brown who's EU Negotiations and Strategy Coordination at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. We have Torbjorn. And we have Russell Antrim, Head of EU Negotiations at the Confederation of British Industry. Well, thank you everyone for, for joining this panel. And um, I thought I'd just start by kind of taking everyone's temperature, really, and asking how likely it is that we get a deal at this point in the negotiations. If you're feeling brave, feel free to put a percentage probability on that outcome, given that Michael Gove recently said 66% chance of a deal. So have a go at that and then perhaps give us your reason for why you have that optimistic or perhaps pessimistic view. Um, Christian, let's like start us off. Ah, thank you and thank you for giving me this opportunity to take part in, uh, in this discussion. Uh, you know that question. I, I, you will, you will. I would disappoint you because I will not give you a, a, any percentages here, simply because I can't do it. But what I think is important to have in mind is that, uh, firstly, we are meeting. We're having this meeting at a, at a very interesting moment, uh, as was said, I think, in in the introduction, that uh, we are just about to have a, a report from the chief negotiator, Michel Barnier to the European Council on where we are in the negotiations. And you will recall that the last round, formal round, we ended on the 2nd of October. And just to give you a bit of sense of the direction, I think that one showed, as Turgeon pointed to, that there were a sort of a atmosphere which was constructive. You saw progress in some areas, some which have been done already. I'm thinking, for instance, on the, some aspects of trading goods, services, some and investments, some on civil nuclear cooperation, and also in participation in union programs. And you saw some new development, positive ones, when it comes to the issue of uh, social safety, uh, social security coordination, respect of fundamental rights, but also when it comes to the conditions for future police and judicial cooperation in criminal matters, which are essential. But there are also these three elements which are still outstanding and which are essential. Uh, one is this whole issue about solid long-term guarantees when it comes to an open and fair competition. We know all about that one. The second is the efficient governance framework. Given that we are aiming for a very deep and rich relation, it's important that we have a governance framework that holds water. And finally, stable, sustainable and long-term agreement on fisheries, which of course would on the one hand take into consideration the United Kingdom's wish to developing the fishing opportunities, but on the same time the ensure sustainable use and protection of the activities of European fishermen. These three are still outstanding and those are going to be essential to find ways of, of agreement on in order for to have an agreement. I stop here. Very good. Thank you, Christian. Um, Thank you, Christian. Anika, would you have to take on the baton and uh, share your view on likelihood of getting a deal at this point? Do we still have you, Annika? So, uh, um, I... Okay. Hello. Can you, everyone hear? Yes. Um, yes. And just said, um, I suppose... Uh, First of all, it's important to state that the UK does want a, 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 a friendly and workable trading relationship with the EU and is striving towards that. Um, as you say, uh, we're now at quite a, a specific turning point in the sense that the Prime Minister stated the 15th of October as a sort of day when really it was time to, to fight, you know, take stock of where we were. Um, but it is very hard at this point to see, as Christian referred to, this is ultimately a political decision. So it's important to listen to what the politicians are saying and 
and uh, Michael Go did say before the House of Lords Committee last week that he thought there was a 66% chance of getting a deal. Um, I think the outstanding issue is around all the fishing quotas are renegotiated and the enforcement mechanism for state aid limits. Um, so there is room for manoeuvre there, but it's option. Um, so consequently, we'll have to wait until today's meeting. Um, and um, obviously, there's also political talks going on at the same time. And just taking the discussion forward about fishing, we've, we've mentioned fishing, both Christian and Anika. It seems like the EU would have to perhaps weaken its mandate and go from asking for continuation of the status quo on access to fishing waters to something less than that. And I was wondering, perhaps, Russell, if you want to take this on, um, do you see that being something the EU will ultimately be willing to do to get the deal or not? Well, I, I mean, I, I think people on the panel will probably speak from the EU side better than me. I think on the UK side, I think Boris Johnson is, is dug in on fish. I think um, status quo really isn't an option for the UK side. Um, I think it's very much a, an example, I suppose, of domestic politics playing out in the negotiations. Um, fishing holds you know, an outsized political importance in the UK um, compared to its relative economic size, particularly I think importantly in towns that the Conservatives took off the Labour Party in 2019. So I think there's a real awareness on the government side that they on fishing. Uh, I, I suppose the big takeaway from the big takeaway is meeting and, and the European Council meeting is just what are the EU fishing states going to be? Potentially, obviously, uh, as has been well reported from Macron, are they going to kind of decide to throw a spanner in the works and go for a maximalist approach today? Um, if they do, I think uh, fishing could become uh, a banana skin. I think that perhaps people weren't quite expecting four, four or five weeks ago when they saw it as being a little bit more academic, more of a numbers game, I suppose. Um, I think just coming back to the, the original question as well, what do I think is going to happen? I, I'd love to give you uh, a, a percentage. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go over the panel and not do that. Um, <laughs> But I think it is a deal within reach. Yes, it is. Is it achievable in the time? Yes, it is. I think I, I've always said, would I bet my house on it? No, I wouldn't. I think actually now, would I bet my house on it? I'd probably have to look at the odds and, and take a decision then. So I think there's definitely progress there. And I think the, the thing that's driving it is actually both sides now are very much in, in a kind of pro deal frame, even the UK government. I think the UK government always adopted a kind of like, you know, we're not going to say we want a deal. We're, we're going to kind of go from there. Um, I think now I, I think it's become much clearer in number 10 that there are key figures there who want a deal. And I think it, it makes real political and economic sense for them to, to achieve one. Uh, and Torbjorn, on, on that EU perspective about willingness to compromise, say on the issue of fisheries, what's your perspective? Do you get the sense that the member states will give Barney that freedom to to make compromise or not? Look, I don't know. Uh, Sweden is the, obviously we are part of this discussion and we are part of the EU, so we stand by the EU positions there, but we are not the major uh, fishing nation. So I don't think uh, I'm, I'm the wrong ambassador to ask about this. But I, I'd say this, that at some, I hope at least that uh, leaders on both sides uh, will be able to uh, look beyond uh, um, the specific issues. And I mean, we all knew that fisheries was going to be difficult. There is no international negotiation that cannot be uh, undermined by fights about fisheries. There is long history of that. So the risk is always there. But if you take a step back and look at this, uh, uh, the world has become a much more difficult place over the last couple of years. Uh, we have immense uh, business interest. We cooperate in so many areas between the UK and, and, and the EU. And I think it is so obviously uh, in both the interest of the United Kingdom and that of all the EU member states to find an agreement. So I hope that we will, that sanity and, and, and common sense in the end will, will prevail. Uh, but uh, to what extent and exactly how that will play out and how the discussions will go today on fisheries, I don't know. Okay, so turning now to the question of the internal market bill, which we know had an effect on these negotiations in terms of the UK seems perhaps breaching trust with the EU by going back on elements of the withdrawal agreement. I was wondering if panellists have a view on how that process has affected these talks and indeed whether the EU might make it a precondition of a trade deal that the UK drops some of the offending clauses in that UK internal market bill. Um, who might like to take a stab at that? Uh, uh, Russell, can I come to you? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I think the I think Michael Gove was pretty clear in the committee. So, well, not clear. I think he hinted at, at what could possibly happen in the committee. So um, I think there was a series of them. So he did hint that many of the issues in, you know, the offending measures, I suppose, in, in the internal market bill um, could be addressed um, or, or dissolved uh, through the joint committee process um, and, and, the, and the free trade agreement. So I don't think they're set in stone. Um, and I think the UK is still very much insisting that there, there are safety nets, um, not a kind of um, uh, a permanent uh, fixture. Um, and, and I think they will be gone if, if an agreement's struck. Um, however, I, th I think the, time, the timelines on, on the kind of, obviously the, the EU have kind of launched legal proceedings. I think the timelines on that provide a little bit of brave, breathing space around the talks over the next couple of, couple of weeks. Um, the UK, but ultimately it has obviously eroded trust on the EU side. And I think the public statements coming from the EU, particularly von der Leyen, who, who made, you know, not unprecedented, but rarely comes out and, and kind of talks about Brexit publicly, actually showed showed the strength of feeling there. Um, but as I said, I don't, I don't think there's any necessarily science behind this, but I think if, if a deal falls into place, the UK would kind of declare victory, I think, and, and pull the clauses. I think there's probably three motivations behind that. I think there's there's growing understanding that actually, if the deal is going to get through the European Parliament, it, you know, the, the, the measures in the internal market bill makes that very difficult and can kind of stir up trouble. I think there's a current state of the US presidential race. I don't think uh, obviously, Biden is 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 favourite to win that, and I think um, you know the um, possible implications on the Good Friday Agreement and and the political repercussions of that would set the UK off on on the wrong foot with a potent, potential new Democrat administration. And then thirdly, I think actually the government underestimated a little bit just the, the power of feeling, particularly in in the Lords, um, and you had pretty prominent pro Brexit Conservative Lords. Who didn't see it as a Brexit issue, they saw it as a rule of law issue. And I think actually the UK government could could come into um, pretty sharp um, conflict uh, in the House of Lords if they didn't uh, drop it. So I think if we get a deal, I think they will be resolved. In a no deal, uh, it, it becomes a lot more complex and, and, and pretty uncertain. And Christian, if I can come to you on that issue, how, how, how was that received on the European side when it came to the UK setting out a position which would be in contradiction of the withdrawal agreement and how do you think that's affected these talks if at all yeah no i think uh, it should not be underestimated the uh, effect that it had you know the eu is based on rule of law and uh, 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 international law is part of that of that uh, context uh, just uh, just as a, as a as a as a as an example very recently the Commission presented rule of law reports for all the EU member states, first time in history, uh, on issues on how that functions. And, and that shows the importance. And the discussions about values is very much in the center of a European debate. And of course, breaking international agreements, or at least giving the, the indication that that could be a way forward, came down badly. And I think it did affect, uh, in, but Torbjorn is better than me to reply to that. But I can imagine in member states there were Lots of eyebrows that were heightened and lots of surprise. And, and uh, as was just said by the, pointed by the recent uh, speaker, uh, President von der Leyen was very clear. And, and it's quite interesting. She, she made the point that this is essential. And what she did was she referred to Thatcher. And she said, so she quoted Thatcher that Britain does not break treaties. It would be bad for Britain, bad for relations with the rest of the world and bad for any future treaty on trade. And I think that, I think, encapsulates a bit the view on that particular point. And that's why it has become also an object of infringement under the withdrawal agreement. And let's be clear on this one. The protocol is not about anything that lapses on the 31st of October, 31st of December. The protocol on Northern Ireland is going to be there irrespective of what kind of deal that we are, are able to agree to. And I think that's very important to have in mind as well. I stop. Thank you, Christian. And then I was wondering now if we could perhaps look to the next kind of weeks and indeed months. And it seems like there's a, a view which says that it's more likely than not that we get a deal at this point. I was wondering because businesses often ask me, well, will there be some kind of implementation period? That's to say, will the changes immediately come in on 1st of January or might there be a scenario where in a deal world, 
the EU and the UK come to some kind of accommodations which stop some of the kind of most harsh impacts from leaving the EU coming into effect from January 1st. So I was wondering, um, what is the possibility, if at all, of such an implementation period? Annika, can I perhaps come to you for that one? Um, I think it all depends on what um, the day and I think sort of doing a quick look forward there, there's a few things on the table uh, the first one and if that could well be negotiated and successfully ratified at this stage but we'll know very soon uh, a situation where we're more close to an Australia style deal uh, there could be unilateral measures contingencies third country agreements uh, bilateral deals so at this stage to be honest with you everything is possible um you know even if the uk leaves without a deal uh, at some point there will be deal struck so it may happen um a few days after the 31st a few months after the 31st and of course it is possible then to for the two parties to agree to um make sure that that trade and flow isn't disrupted um, but at this stage, we just don't know a, what type of deal we're going to a lot of grey areas in between or a lot of potential uh, situations in between the Australia style deal. Um, so, yes, that's possible. Will it happen at this stage? We don't know. Before I put that question also to Tor Torbjorn, I was wondering, um, uh, audience, if you have questions, do feel free to put them in the chat function. I'll, I'll put them to our panellists. Um, Torbjorn, would I take on the bat on there? And yes, that question of an implementation period, do you think that's something that's got any legs to it? Is that something that's talked about in, in, in European circles or, or is that something that, um, or, or not? I mean, it depends on what you mean by, by it, uh, I think. Um, uh, they, I mean, you have elements of implementation period already in the withdrawal agreement. If you look, for example, at citizens' rights, um, people who arrive in the UK uh, throughout the transition period will have the right to stay and they can apply for that up the, the, the new settled status scheme up until June next year. So already there you have uh, uh, somewhat of an, of an introductory phase. Um, I think it depends. I, I think there is openness to this, and I think it has to some degree been touched upon in the negotiations. But uh, I think Britain will have to ask for it. If Britain wants uh, uh, phasing in of certain measures, I think there is an openness on the EU side to discuss that. Um, and I haven't been, uh, I don't know what has happened in the last couple of days in the discussions that's been, but certainly there's an openness to discuss that. Um, I would be a bit cautious about talking about implementation phases and uh, uh, mini deals and stuff like that linked to no deal. And I, I, I'm personally, I don't use this, the, uh, uh, the rhetoric or the talking about Australia type deal. Um, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, I, I think the British government uh, is using that to describe a no deal scenario. It means there won't be a deal. There won't be any Australia type deal because that means no deal. And I would be, I'm, uh, I'm afraid that if there is no deal, it is not going to be so easy to just resuscitate negotiations and find an agreement a, a couple of weeks later. Uh, I think there is significant risk that uh, developments will, uh, uh, will take a course of their own uh, after New Year if we are in a no deal scenario. Um, and I think for me, this is one of the reasons why I, I feel it's, it is really, really important to find an agreement now or in the next couple of weeks because uh, um, I think there is, a, there is a tendency, particularly on the British side, uh, uh, but maybe also on the EU side, I follow the British debate a bit closer, to underestimate the risks and the potential pitfalls if we don't have an agreement in place uh, when Britain leaves the transition period. Uh, uh, we will uh, all come to regret that if that would be the situation. No, that's very interesting. And we just had a question in from, from Peter asking, you know, is it the case that if there was no deal signed, we could then do a deal in just a few months time? Um, I, I was wondering, perhaps Russell, I can come to you. What do you make of that kind of grey area? So, you know, if we get to a, a no deal outcome, how quickly could things get 
put back together again? Or would it be the case that it will be a while before we can actually do anything with the European Union from a UK perspective? Russell, can you take that one? Uh, yeah, sorry, I was uh, having complications. I'm muting. By, I'm mute button. Um, I think that it's difficult. I think the view from number 10 in, in a nil, no deal scenario and when things will kind of be wrapped back up again, um, I think they'd probably want to confound uh, the EU's belief that they're just going to kind of come rushing back, um, suddenly make lots of um, uh, concessions and, and then get a deal, a deal in place. I think is, is there going to be a cooling off period after a no deal? Again, I don't really know. Perhaps the government would look to make quick agreements in, in high priority areas. And I think in, for instance, aviation, haulage, um, uh, you know, keeping planes flying, trucks rolling. I think the EU have have kind of had a long held position that that kind of stuff may be done in, in, a, in a no deal case. But um, I don't think there's ever been any indication of anything else. I mean, that could possibly change. Let's see. But I think I think, it, you know, it's going to be fairly limited. Um, I also don't think the UK government, if we're talking about extension of any kind, the UK government aren't going to ask for anything like with ECJ jurisdiction. That's just not going to happen. I think what they'll probably do is say, right, we're taking a common sense approach, something like they've done around the border operating model. Um, and, and it would be sensible for the EU to, to mirror some of that. I, I think that will probably be the extent of where, you know, um, facilitations or prep preparing for a no deal cliff edge um, would would be. Um, in, in the case of a deal, I think it becomes a little bit more um, interesting, I suppose. Neither side are really talking about, you know, facilitations. Um, as I said, again, I think it would make it a lot easier if we got a deal. You know, you could start seeing some of those edges being softened up a little bit, I suppose. Um, but again, until we really know, kind of following on from what Annika said, I think until we know where, you know, what trajectory we're on, um, uh, you know, I don't think there's any kind of certainty on, on where those will be. Okay, and just a final question I have for, for this panel, uh, which is about timings. So Boris Johnson had this deadline of October 15th. He said he'd walk away. There wasn't a deal by that point in time, but now he's saying he's going to assess the uh, state of play after the European Council. So um, I was wondering, perhaps come to you, Christian, in terms of what you see as the kind of real deadlines here when it comes to talks have to finish by this point in time if we are to have a deal. What, what is the real deadline and why, why is that the real deadline? Well, um, let me also come back to what you just asked, but let me start with this one. Uh, deadline, well, now, as soon as possible. Uh, we, we will have to go through a ratification process in the European Parliament. That's not done over a day. Uh, and uh, we also need to get the scribbling of the, of the legal text right. So uh, the time is now, as soon as possible. Uh, and, uh, and my understanding is that discussions are going on, but as we have discussed in the panel, there are issues that are, are serious and that's not yet been addressed. Just on you, what you said just uh, before, I think this is important. The first thing is that on the 31st of the December, UK will leave the single market, it will leave the customs union, it will leave all EU policies, and it will leave all international agreements. And then what we're talking about is how much the new agreement can be enriched by elements that are part of this, but it becomes an agreement between the EU and the UK. Just so that that is clear. And that means in, in concrete terms that there will be custom formalities with all, all imports and exports. There will be no longer recognize EU type approvals for, for cars, for instance, and there will not be a a, a financial passport, three examples of it. So that is a reality, irrespective of what kind of deal we get. But from the EU's point of view, the ambition is a rich deal. The political declaration, which is substantive, that is what we would like to reach, but not at any, any cost. Huh? And so that is the ambition we have put into it. My understanding is that UK has not really had the same kind of ambition which has come out in negotiations. And finally, there is no Australia deal. There's no deal with Australia. Australia is, is trading with the UK under WTO, um, uh, WTO uh, uh, provisions. So that means de facto no deal. Just to be clear on that, and I stop here. 
Good. Well, yeah, thank you for that uh, dose of realism, Christian, in terms of the situation we face. And uh, thank you to all our panellists. We've, we've run out of time for, for our discussion, but I think, yeah, we have some optimism for a deal, but still some grey areas. And we are at a very delicate moment in these negotiations. So, yes, thank you very much to Russell, Torbjorn, Christian and Annika for our discussion about the political negotiations. Uh, it now uh, leads to me to introduce our next panel, which is going to be focusing more on <laughs> the business elements of Brexit. We're going to be talking about the impacts on firms and their preparation and scenario planning. So uh, allow me to introduce our, our second panel. We have Emma Savenborg, the Trade Policy Advisor at the National Board of Trade Sweden, Anders Ekblad, Director of Corporate Strategy at Volvo Group, Jonas Arell, Managing Director at Scandi Kitchen and Gustav Bergström, who's a Trade and Invest Commissioner for the UK at Business Sweden. Uh, welcome to our panel. Can you all see me and hear me? So, hello. And hello. Uh, rem hello. Our, hello, hello. <laughs> and reminder to our audience, do feel free to send questions in on the chat function. I'll do my best to ask them uh, as, as, as many as I can. So yes, um, welcome all to the panel. Uh, let me start by asking perhaps Anders and Jonas, if you could give us a view on what specific preparations have you been making for Brexit? Um, and perhaps you could talk about, are there any areas where you feel like you haven't been able to prepare because of the ongoing political uncertainty? Um, Anders, could I perhaps start with you? Yeah, sure, absolutely, thank you. Uh, but first of all, UK is an important and prioritous market for the entire Volvo Group. And uh, taking care of our customers are one of our core values. So yes, we are well prepared. And it will take me like half hour to go through everything we have done. But let What's me the most say, important thing? <laughs> <laughs> I've had 11 work streams um, throughout the entire company working on different uh, topics. So it, it is, for us, it's, it's two sides actually. It's uh, our commercial side, our customers, dealers, taking care of them. And then we have the operational side where we need to ensure that we can produce uh, commercial products uh, uh, according to our customers' uh, demands, of course. And just if I may press you on this, what is the preparation stream that you think has perhaps been most important on which if you hadn't done would have been most disruptive to your, to your business? Wow, uh, it's been so many unknown unknowns in this process. So for, for us, it's just been uh, working very in, in, a, in a structured way. Uh, also trying to understand ahead of time because we need to take decisions way ahead of time to make sure that we can implement them in time. So that again, uh, making sure that our customers are fine supply chains, uh, we have so many systems that we depend on and, and our working uh, working people uh, brands everything so um yeah all systems go and uh, jonas perhaps you can take up this mantle uh, what what kind of specific preparations have you been making for brexit what have been the most important do you think most important is is just look, it's getting a house in order and preparing for something which we still feel is, is a rather unknown process um, coming into sort of quarter one, uh, just after the, the sort of Brexit happens in, in, in actual fact. We have done, worked hard with our suppliers and, you know, getting a supply chain, which is far less complicated, I must admit, than Anders and Volvo's supply chain. Um, ours is simple, get stuff across the border. We, we have a few unknowns where we are unsure how the customs procedures will sort of pan out, you know, are there going to be delays? We work in food and we work in food and drinks. So obviously things like speed um, and, you know, products expiring, um, you know, being sat waiting for uh, customs clearance. And that is, is, of course, very important to us. And I don't feel like we have enough clarity from the negotiations and from, you know, the, the, and, and confidence perhaps in the systems as they are to really say like on in January, everything's be, be flowing and, and, and the UK will have as much food milk as they want, right? That's unlikely to happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to pick you up on the customs question shortly. I think it's fascinating to know what you're going to do about that. What's your strategy? But we'll come to that in a moment. Let me come to Emma and Gustav. Um, what is the top advice you're giving to companies at this point in time when it comes to Brexit preparations? Emma, perhaps you start. Um, I would say 
many companies, especially big companies that already trade globally, they are prepared for the customs procedures. I think that's my uh, least worry. Um, I recommend companies to look at the regulatory aspects. Um, for example, if you're exporting, importing uh, products, do you fulfill, uh, do you have the licenses, the labeling, um, if you're importing CE products, um, do you know that it can only be uh, labeled CE within the EU, EES, or Turkey, for example? Uh, otherwise, you can become responsible for that. Um, the regulatory aspect also when it comes to services, um, that will be a, a huge change for companies uh, after UK leaves. Do you have the right licenses? Um, do you need any recognition of professional qualifications? Um, so don't only look at the, the, um, the procedures at the border, uh, look at the regulatory aspects of, of things. And Gustav, you, your view on this in terms of advice you've been giving? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, no, but I, I, I mirror um, uh, Emma's view here regarding and Anders regarding the larger companies. The larger companies obviously are very, very prepared. We just came out of a in-depth interview study with about 20 of them to understand you know, their biggest concerns and, and also the outlook on the UK market from after Brexit. And I think the regulatory, potential regulatory drift is, is a massive uh, concern for many of them, but also the new trade procedures and, and also restrictions of, of free movement. Uh, but I think we're a bit worried about, you know, the smaller businesses. Uh, there are about 3,000 exporters to, uh, to the UK from Sweden. And uh, I think the level of preparedness there is not at the level it should be, uh, I think, at this point of time. So we, you know, from a business Sweden perspective, we we're trying to do as much as we can to inform and and uh, uh, advise these companies, and we are running uh, courses for for these companies. There is one on the 29th of October, uh, for instance, regarding the the necessary steps they need to take. Good, and then um, so you, let, let, let's focus on the customs question. Notwithstanding Emma's points about regulatory stuff behind the border, um, I very interested to know what strategies Jonas and um, and uh, and Anders you have in terms of how you're going to cope with the border because obviously the UK government's reasonable worst case scenario is you know 7,000 truck long queues I think there's a view that even in a kind of good scenario there'll probably still be disruption at the border and it'll be hard to get goods through so I'm wondering what kind of strategies and mitigations have you both put in place to to, to deal with that so Anders perhaps you can start. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we are across, across our entire uh, supply chain to ensure that we have a readiness to implement the new customs uh, routines, for instance, uh, both internally and with the uh, partners that will help us with that. We have also uh, been in discussion with the transport uh, uh, companies to ensure that they have uh, capacity and availability for transports. And on top of that, we have evaluated our uh, stock for products and parts, both for to set up um, uh, safety stock uh, on, on, uh, in our production facilities, uh, at our warehouses, at our dealers, just to ensure that the entire network uh, will be up and running, whatever happens uh, 1st of January. And Jonas, your plans? Uh, again, I'll, I'll echo Anders, you know, but in a vastly smaller scale. Um, we have, you know, we, we, we run the rule over, over our current inventory. We, we looked at what products do we feel we can bring in loads, we secure additional space to, to keep stock and bring that in uh, whilst we deal with the uh, outcome of, you know, what, 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 what will happen um, come January. What we are still, you know, we, we run uh, supply chain tests with our suppliers. We still are not 100% sure we are fully uh, up to speed with all the regulatory uh, requirements that will happen. And I don't think that's clear enough. And, and I'm sure experts will tell me differently that it's quite clear to them. However, for us in, in the food and drinks industry, we've also been extremely busy during this COVID induced lockdown and, and the period that we, so we basically have been flat out and we, we've, we've just, you know, managed to turn, um, you know, ourselves to, from, from, a, from a very sort of bricks and mortar led uh, um, 
operation to very much an e-commerce led operation and then that has had its challenges in in itself and and i suppose to a large extent we has not been business as usual for anyone uh, but for a small company that you know luckily been been very fortunate in being busy we've not been able to spend as much time and we have not come into contact with the those experts who perhaps could have otherwise advised us on you know further regulatory and 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 uh, procedural um, what should we say, procedural uh, requirements coming into to sort of the Brexit, post-Brexit uh, era. And do you use a customs agent or a customs intermediary to help you with the moving across the border? Look, I think that the, the, the reason we are not panicking is that we've, we've been trading with Norway for 10 years, as in as, as, a, as an exporter. So we, we've dealt with the, the, the way that customs work and, and we have used various um, customs agents. You know, we have three or four different ones that we use for different ports because they're, they're just basically quicker. We, we work quite closely with our transport partners to make sure that, and, and that we are moving towards using them as, as a customs agents, but merely, merely, you know, for the reasons that they are, they are sitting on the trailers that come in. So they would be the people closest to the source, so to speak. So in that respect, yes, we do feel like we, we're on top of it. And we do feel like they as transport companies are on top of the regulatory requirements to bring stuff in. Of course, as, as Emma uh, and mentioned that there are uh, further requirements in terms of labeling and, and certification and, and those sort of things that perhaps we are not uh, as far with as, as we would like. However, we feel that we, you know, and unfortunately we'll be using a bit of a government approach here. We, we, we feel like we are m one of many who are in that situation. And I tell you what, one thing I do know, I'm not a political expert, but no government, no politicians have ever been re-elected having caused a famine or you know a shortage of food <laughs> that's for sure right so that is my that's my hope yeah that's a fascinating point um i think there's a worry in the uk that the, the government here is somewhat ideological to the point that they might be willing to tolerate a short-term disruption if it means they get their long-term gains of brexit regulatory freedom and so on but i totally get your point and that's a, that's fascinating um i wanted to ask about blind spots for companies perhaps good stuff now you can talk to us about this do you, do you see common blind spots when it comes to preparations for brexit even amongst firms that are wanting to prepare i mean emma you mentioned the behind the border stuff the regulatory stuff perhaps some case studies come to mind or particular examples you're seeing uh, in the market um whoever likes to come in on that uh, one thing that i think it's 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 very important for all companies uh, that aren't exactly related to the negotiation. It's about um, transfer of personal data. Mm. Um, we're waiting for the adequacy decision. Um, we had two ECJ rulings in the last month. That's been a little bit worrying, I would say, um, about when we will get this adequacy decision. And I think as a company, this is something you cannot wait until uh, the 31st of, of December uh, to see if we get this adequacy decision, mm -hmm. but you have to uh, have measures in place that you will be able to keep transferring data um, from 1st of January. So this is a, um, I think this is an area where it's uh, all companies that trade uh, transfer personal data between, uh, between the countries. And once the UK leave, um, it's a third country and the GDPR says um, you can't, the, the rule is you can't transfer data uh, outside. Um, so you have to have uh, measures in place to be able to do that. Um, this is something when we ask companies, have you, have you prepared for this? Um, this is a blind spot. And they, I don't know if it's because they don't know um, what to do or, or if they, they're waiting for the adequacy decision. But that's, um, that's something I think companies need to um, prepare for. And that means what, writing standard contractual clauses into their contract? Exactly. And... exactly. There, are, there are a couple of things you can do actually, uh, but you need, to, <laughs> you need to prepare for them to be able to, uh, to keep transfer data. So yeah. yeah. And Gustav, your perspective? No, I, 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 um, I agree with Emma there again. I mean, when we did our study now, we saw that there were companies actually moving their uh, data operations to the UK from this perspective. But I think from a, from a smaller company perspective, I think there are a lot of uh, blind spots. I mean, if you don't uh, trade with a third country today that the UK will become, 
uh, and you don't really know about the effects thereof. I think you have a lot of blind spots uh, that you can find answer to, but you, you might not know that you have to. So, uh, so I think that, that's a big issue. Mm. And um, I'm interested also in the, the effects of coronavirus and how that's might affect Brexit preparations. Gustav, have you seen any evidence of ways in which the, the pandemic has perhaps inhibited preparations? No, we actually, so, so this study again that we did, we, we looked at, uh, you know, we looked at two perspectives. So uh, one, one was from a Brexit uh, vote perspective up until now, and the other one was a two, three year ahead perspective. And I think uh, companies that we interviewed, I mean, they are in, in sectors that there are a lot of investments and where Sweden is particularly uh, strong, so most of them at least. And they haven't really seen any large impacts on, on either uh, sales, investments or production during, during the time up until now. Obviously, this, has, this year has been a bump, but overall, they see quite strong underlying demand for, for their products uh, and services. And that, uh, that demand, they see, will, will continue the next two, three years as well. So I think most of them believe that you know they remain very confident in the UK market and, and committed to the UK market. And like Andrew said, um, they are here for the long long game. And uh, obviously, COVID has been a bump on the road uh, and will be probably for for some time. And and as as to your question, I'm sure it's taken some focus away from from preparations, but. On the other hand, they've you know they've known this this has been coming right for the last few years, and there have been been a few deadlines before two three deadlines uh, right that they have been preparing towards. Uh, so I think the the level per, level of preparedness again among the larger companies is is quite solid. Uh, we just had a question coming on the Q and A, and to, to, to stay with you, Gustav, do you have specific examples of blind spots when it comes to preparations among smaller companies? Um, not specific examples. I, I think it, you know, I think the whole the whole Brexit um, uh, happening could be blind, blind spots for them, right? If you're not used to to trade with com uh, countries outside of the EU today, uh, I think that that's a whole that, that's a main blind spot if if you take if you if you if you look at it from from that perspective. But I think Jonas uh, mirrored a lot of the the big. Uh, effects that um, that they have to look into um, so I, I think it's all about trying really to to uh, oversee your your operations and your exposure to the UK and and uh, from that develop uh, various scenarios that could happen and pre prepare yourself for that uh, there's there's a lot of um, uh, great support out there to get uh, from from ourselves but our colleagues around uh, around here as well today just moving our thoughts to a no-deal scenario, I was wondering if um, Anders and uh, Jonas, you could talk to us about what that would mean for your businesses. If there was to be tariffs, for example, on UK-EU trade, would that make the UK market not worth dealing with or, 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 or what? Uh, Anders, what do you think? Uh, definitely not. I think that, again, UK is an important and prioritised market and uh, it will stay that way. Uh, in terms of a no-deal, I think that we will face a lot of uh, initial friction uh, that will pass uh, with time. Uh, how that will pass will be uh, a lot of uh, decisions that we have to make and, and implement uh, short term and long term. Um, I mean, at this point, we have, we have looked at under every rock, every stone and, and even the pebbles. <laughs> I mean, we have looked into uh, uh, cases in, in today, with one exep exception, we have all our production at mainland EU. We have one production fa facility in Motherwell, Scotland. So, I mean, looking into the future, how, who knows how that will be? We have uh, several suppliers in UK that are uh, extremely important to us. So, we need to uh, we need to manage that in the future and we have an ongoing dialogue with all of them at this point uh, better than ever so at this point we prepare for the worst hope for the best and how different is your no deal plan to your deal outcome plan are they particularly the same. Different? it's just the consequences today so it's the same preparations that we will implement uh, regardless so it's just the consequences the effects that 
uh, a no deal scenario will um, uh, will give. That's very interesting, uh, Jonas. Your your thoughts on no deal? What that would mean for your business with the UK? I, I look. I I stay sort of with the the scenario I I, I I sort of painted out earlier, where I think quarter one is going to be a bit of a mess. In all fairness, and I think that you know I'm with Anders that you know the no deal or the deal scenario is is pretty much the same for us. We, we don't understand or fully appreciate perhaps what will happen at the borders. We we do understand you know for us it's, it's easy because the UK is our market, so you know we, we'll be here. We have scenarios where you know we will culling products and we'll have uh, you know fewer lines because obviously the administrative uh, burden of bringing small smaller quantities of anything will be too high so we just simply cull them um, and then we are unsure what we're going to tell our bigger customers you know supermarkets and the like you know what is the price well look we, we don't know as in there is a tariff we'll pass it on as in but it will be the same for everyone so I think the preparation, um, so for for a deal or no deal, is is, is you know is the same. Is is what is the, the procedural uh, effects and, and regulatory effects? Yes, is one of them. But I think you know there'll be three months a bit of a. To be honest, it, it'll be a bit chaotic. I, I you know I can't really see it any other way. But I think in Q two we, we will we'll we'll have worked it out somehow. I think it's, 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 it's hard to get that very consistent message of your, your, your preparations are the same for both outcomes. Because in the UK, I find lots of businesses are like, oh, if there's a deal, it will be fine. We don't need to prepare. And I think that's a, the government here is getting very worried about, about that kind of mm. train of thought, which it, it, it is inaccurate. And we've had a question come through, Anders, about the price of a Volvo car in the event of a no deal. But am I right in thinking that the business you work in is not car focused? No, it's everything but cars. So right, all okay. these areas are <laughs> trucks, construction equipment, buses, and Penta, and Penta is marine and industrial applications. So everything by cars. But you, there would be tariffs on exporting those to the UK in an ideal scenario? Yes, uh, in, in a range of zero to about 20%, in worst okay. case. And would that be debilitating or, or not? Uh, that, that's a commercial decision by a business area or brand. So uh, again, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, but it's complex to give one answer to. So. Okay, yeah. um, we're running out of time for our panel. Please do keep sending in questions. The final question I have is just perhaps I get to get a view on your level of optimism about how the first quarter goes. I mean, Jonas, you've been quite clear that you think there's going to be disruption and that's just kind of a mess coming. Um, Emma, Gustav, perhaps you could share some thoughts on your level of optimism. There will be disruption in your view. Yeah, yeah I, I think there will be short. Oh, sorry, Emma. <laughs> no, you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I agree. I think there will be short term uh, disruptions. And that's also been mirrored by the companies we've been speaking to. But, you know, during this study, I think it gives quite an optimistic view uh, fr from the com Swedish companies on the UK and, and the commitment they, they still, independent of, of Brexit, show to the market and the, the hope in the market. So I'm, I'm quite positive uh, about the long, longer term. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that Anders and Jonas are preparing for the same because that's what, what we're trying to communicate. Um, a free trade agreement will not solve all the issues. Um, they will take away tariffs, but there will, will still be uh, a lot of friction. Uh, I would say I'm more worried about the long term because um, we will see maybe more uh, changes in standards, um, regulatory uh, divergence, uh, divergence in other areas. Um, so I would say it's it's the short term will be it will be friction, but I'm more worried about the long term. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for your contributions to our panel. We're out of time, but uh, I apologize if I haven't asked your question from the audience. Uh, we'll hopefully get to those in the next session. But yes, thank you, Emma. Thank you, Gustav. Thank you, Anders. Thank you, Jonas. And uh, yes, um, move on to our next panel. So we are now going to go even more into the details because we know that business is all about the detail, the devil's in the detail. And we have three fantastic experts uh, who can talk to us about uh, about the specific details in areas that matter. So we have Lars Carlson, who's the Managing Director at KGH Custom Services. We have Maria Almerud, the country leader of Sweden at TMF Group, and Lucy Elborn, who's an immigration solicitor at North Star Law. So we're going to get super geeky now. We're going to get right into what specifically companies need to be doing in these 
super important areas. We're talking customs, services, immigration. Um, so welcome, panelists. Let me start with Lars. You are our customs man. Um, so tell me, what, what work have you been doing with businesses so far when it comes to Brexit preparations? And what do you think businesses have to be doing if they're going to be ready for January 1st? Thank you very much and good morning, everybody. It's great to be on. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, there, is a, there is a need to prepare. There's no doubt about it. I was really happy to hear the, the last panel also saying that even, you know, in sometimes in media, it seems like be, if there is a deal, then there's no problems. And if there's no deal, there's lots of problems. And, and as they said, I would very much underline the fact that the border procedures, the, the, uh, the, all the non-tariff barriers are there regardless if there is a free trade agreement or not. The free trade agreement only has any impact on, on basically the tariffs itself and also Northern Ireland, those who have traffic there. Uh, however, having said that, it's important to, to actually do a real uh, preparation. And we have helped more than 500 companies and we have still not been in one company that is prepared enough. Uh, <laughs> it's, that's the way it is with preparedness. Uh, and obviously what we need, what people need to look at is the cost they will get and how they will actually solve the practical matters, meaning that there will be customs procedures from 1st of January. They will be different from the European Union side, from the UK side. Uh, and uh, people need to know what to do, you know, to how to handle those the, the documentations that needs to be there in custom declarations and other type of documentation, licensing, uh, authorizations and so forth. Uh, there are also an interesting from the last discussion uh, around contracting. So if there will be two types of new ad additional costs involved, one is tariffs, if there's no FTA and if the FTA is not covering my, my type of goods. Uh, that's one type of, of cost, of course. But the other type of cost is this extra administration burden that will be there. Uh, and of course, then it goes down to contracting. I met many companies who have in their, their clauses different types of income terms and, and delivery terms that actually you know, decides already in the contracting where those costs will actually uh, stay. Uh, and obviously, this is something to look, to look into. Competence is another one. Capacity, if you need service providers to help you out with declarations and other type of documentation. And that is probably the, the area that, that worries me the most. There is a lack of, of competence and capacity in the market in UK for the moment, and people will need help. And my final comment in the initial here would be that go through a list. There is a list. They are available from some of the agencies that was involved in the former panel. Um, contact an expert company and, and get uh, advice. Uh, but there's a list of things that every company needs to do. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's just to calculate also one, two things. One, how practically do I do my import and export on 1st of January? And secondly, and that we know now. And secondly, what else the extra cost I will have and who is taking the burden of that? Great. Thank you, Lars. And we'll come back to some specific customs questions uh, as this discussion develops. Um, Maria, perhaps I can turn to you. From a services perspective, um, what, what do you think are the most important changes businesses should be preparing for at this stage and, and are preparing for? So from the um, regulatory and compliance perspective, uh, I think that three major items one can focus on is uh, first one, I think it's important to come back to basics of the company's formation. So what does the current setup look like? Is, uh, is company going to be compliant say on January 2nd? Uh, in the absence of the agreement, allowing another treatment uh, the change uh, will, uh, for, for instance, concern the uh, UK, uh, UK management of the Swedish companies. And uh, another big category is uh, the branches of the, the Swedish branches of the UK companies uh, from the Swedish perspective. If no measures are taken um, in, in, in the regard uh, beforehand, these companies risk to be uh, uh, non-compliant as, of, as from uh, the beginning of the next year. And this, this uh, compliance here uh, includes, uh, uh, from the perspective of Swedish regulations, the, uh, the, the elements include the taking care of the, uh, com the, the boards of uh, company directors, uh, the, the company de deputy directors. Uh, according to the Swedish regulation, uh, no less than half of the board should be, resident, should be residing in the European economic area. So um, unless this uh, is thought through, then uh, the company is risking with the board and which ultimately uh, after some time can lead to the involuntary liquidation of such company. Another uh, factor is if you think of the company auditors, 
same uh, applies here. So the auditor should be residing in Sweden or in some other uh, European country, which the UK would not be covered. So, and uh, the company should also have uh, at least one signatory residing in Sweden. Uh, the items might be covered by a point in say a process agent, for example, but uh, this, uh, again, the setup is not always uh, working that way. And if company would seek for exempt, the company might struggle to show that the operational part and the management can uh, effectively uh, provide the uh, run the business in Sweden from the country which is located outside of the EU, uh, especially uh, now when we have uh, restrictions on the traveling and uh, access uh, is much more limited to the to the company operations. When it comes to Swedish branches of the UK companies, uh, we have a similar rule applying here. The managing director of the branch should be uh, residing in the European economic area and, say, and, and the deputy as well. Again, one can submit here the uh, um, seek, uh, seek exempt or appoint uh, another local uh, managing director. Another, complica another uh, complication for the branches can be that, that uh, right now the Swedish branches of the UK companies are exempt from the uh, submission of the financial statements for the branch itself. So they only file the financial statements of their parent company. And this, uh, according to the situation as it stands now, uh, this will change and uh, extra burden will be put on the branches in terms of uh, preparation and filing their financial, their financial statements for the branch itself. The second point one can think of is uh, uh, various uh, tax registrations uh, and um, and then, then this concerns uh, so VAT registrations and F-tax registrations uh, for F-tax, for example, uh, because the, uh, for, the, for, for, for the registration of the uh, F-tax, uh, there is a high, high requirement for the uh, closed person, so-called so associates, associated or closed persons uh, outside of the EU. So for uh, disclosure of their uh, tax compliance, this, uh, this is another complication which uh, is at risk if, if it's uh, not uh, covered by some uh, version of the treaty. And the, the last, but not the least item uh, as it has been brought up uh, already in the previous panel is various reg re regulatory and compliance items, various registrations and reporting uh, matters. Um, the, the, the uh, effect of uh, <clears throat> CRS on UBO registrations. If we, for example, for instance, take a branch, uh, at the moment, uh, there is no obligation to register uh, UBO of the, uh, of the branch if, uh, the if the parent company is located in the uh, European Union, in, in the European uh, Union. However, if uh, when once uh, uh, the UK leaves uh, the EU and the, unless there is another agreement, then uh, the, this registration should be uh, put in place. So that means that uh, disclosing the UBOs or uh, or the absence of those or registering the absence of those. So um, I would agree here with uh, uh, Lars uh, in the uh, in the business advice. This is good uh, to run these questions through in advance through your uh, corporate partner. Uh, on the ground and get help uh, in secure and being compliant in advance as a push comes to shove. So uh, similar as in customs, uh, you uh, can get your expert here. Uh, uh, this is something that we are, the regulatory uh, part is something that we are dealing with and uh, we can look at the, the uh, preparations. And this is something that we, we are getting uh, quite many client requests as well for to, secure in advance before the uh, date, the basic uh, compliance and uh, corporate patterns. I can imagine. And, and Lucy, on the immigration perspective, um, perhaps you can set out for us what the kind of key things companies need to be thinking about are and, and what preparations are being made on that front. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, of course. I would say, I, I guess, to start that the, the good thing about immigration is that we aren't waiting for a deal or no deal situation. The From the UK side, at least, the decision on what is happening 
um, for citizens um, who are living here has been made regardless of any trade deal. So that's reassuring, I think, for, for, the, for the individuals concerned. Um, my, my recommendation for companies is firstly to make sure that your employees are aware that they have to make an application if they're a European citizen under the EU settled status scheme. Um, the deadline for that is not actually until 30th of June 2021. So individuals have a little longer than the, perhaps they realise. Um, so that's definitely something to, to bear in mind now and to encourage employees to go ahead and make their application if they have not done so. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that although the deadline to apply is 30th of June next year, the uh, employee individual must have been resident in the UK by 31st of December this year in order to be successful under that scheme. So I would suggest that you know, there's only so much a company can control. If you're, uh, and I'll come on in a moment to, to write to work checks later in 2021. Um, but for instance, if you do have people that you are bringing over from your European offices who are European economic area citizens, if you are thinking, well, yeah, I'd like them to start mid-January, maybe you should be considering bringing them over um, a little earlier than that and bringing them over before 31st of December. Um, I can go into you know, the long detail of how you do the settlement scheme. I think it's probably something for the Q&A if people have those specific questions. Um, but I would say that the, the term resident in the UK is not as strict as, you know, having a house, having a bank account, having a job that you've already started. It's physical presence in the UK um, is how it's actually been defined at the moment. So I'm not saying someone should just pop over for a holiday and count themselves as, as resident, but certainly if you're coming over for a job interview to, you know, to meet your team, even if you aren't ready until mid-January to actually move house, it's certainly viable to, to come over and start those job duties um, you know, and look for an apartment and then make the move later in January. Um, the next thing I guess to bear in mind is that um, the right to work checks you'll need to do for European economic area citizens who are employees are actually not changing on 1st of January. Um, currently, what you have to do is just look at um, see the original passport or national ID card of those individuals when they begin work with you. That is not changing on 1st of January. That is continuing until at least 30th of June 2021. Um, the one thing I would, however, say, which uh, and, and the Home Office have said, you know, you should not be discriminating against European citizens. You cannot require them to prove that they have applied under the settlement scheme until at least 1st of July next year. Um, and they've also said you do not need to do retrospective um, checks on current employees. The one area I'm concerned about, which I don't think has been resolved, is there is a, a provision under UK immigration law that you cannot employ someone when you have, you know, or have a reasonable cause to believe that they do not have the right to work in the UK. So on the one hand, you have the government saying all you have to do for your right to work check is see the passport no further questions. If you have someone who, let's say, starts with you in March next year and during their first day of work saying, isn't it great, London? I just moved here last week. I'd never been to the UK before. Um, you know, it's really great. You're starting to wonder at what point are you meant to be questioning that and, and wondering, actually, do they have the right to work here? Mm. That's something I don't think has yet been resolved. Um, and that's something that is, is on my mind a lot. <laughs> um, so that's something to bear in mind. But with the caveat the Home Office have said you should not be requiring anyone to show that they have a settled status scheme um, documentation before, before July next year. Um, and I guess my final point for now is for any companies that do not already have what's called the tier two uh, skilled uh, sponsored worker license, which they would use currently for non-EA citizens, the Home Office are very much pushing the idea that in the future, that is what you will need to use if you are employing EA, EA citizens going forward who, who obviously don't qualify under the current scheme. Um, and it's very much worth companies looking and if they don't have a tier two license already, um, considering making that skilled license, skilled worker license application now. 
Good. Well, that's an excellent overview of the three big areas we're going to be talking about. And apologies, I forgot to mention at the start of this discussion that uh, audience, you will have the ability to go into a private room with each of our experts at 11.30. So if you have a specific question, uh, you'll, be, you'll, you'll be able to get it answered there. Um, Lucy, can I just continue with you on the question of business travel? So obviously lots of trade and commerce between the UK and the EU is a function of people doing like quick shuttle journeys or business trips and so on. Do we know at this stage how that would be affected, if at all? So at the moment, um, it is clear that European citizens who are not resident here will still fall under the, um, the visitor rules as exists now for, for third party, third, third country nationals now. Um, there are several things you can do as a visitor uh, in the UK that includes attending meetings with clients, um, conducting negotiations, visiting your UK branch of your company to conduct or receive training. Um, so there are several things you can actually do and it's quite a wide, uh, wide list of, of activities that are permitted. It has been confirmed that as is the case with many country citizens at the moment, there'll be no visa requirement for that. So a European citizen can just continue to travel and just show their passport at the border along with confirmation of, of what they will be doing. Right. Um, and, and as I say, I suspect that that won't happen from January 1st. I suspect there will be a little bit of a leeway in terms of having those kind of questions at the border for some time. Good. That's reassuring news. Um, Lars, I come to you on the customs question. It seems like as a business, your choice at this stage is to get a customs agent, customs intermediary, or it's to do declarations yourself, or it's to try and use some kind of in-house software to, to process the paperwork. What's your view on how companies should approach that question of dealing with their new customs burden? No, of course, we know there's 150,000 companies alone in UK that hasn't done export and import procedures before. And from 1st of January, they have to do export declarations uh, and pre-launch them as well. So that it's not only to do the declaration, but it's also to actually have access to the systems, as you're, uh, you're mentioning, by HMRC and other agencies. Uh, so obviously, the, these are the free choices. Either you have in, internal co competence and that you should have anyway, regardless of size. And of course, there are a really good support for that, for instance, for the UK Customs Academy, which is also supported by grant money to actually do digital online training to get at least the, the, the say, uh, level you need to have. Then, of course, you can decide if you're going to use a, a, a service provider of some kind, either the logistic company or a broker or anyone. One of the issues there is Again, it's very uh, important to be, be out in time. We have 78 days to go, but there's still 78 days to go. Uh, but there is a capacity issue here. Uh, many of the brokers, many of the freight forwarders are already uh, taking on what the, the load they can. And there is a gap in the market to do that. But I would recommend everybody who hasn't done it before, at least to, to look at the cost for the two. You know, do I train my own people or hire somebody that can do it in, in, a, in a way that is also, as Maria said, is, is compliant enough? Because this is a big undertaking to do, uh, because there will be agencies, agency uh, officials coming later on and check, you know, did you do this in the right way or not? And this is, of course, only for the export out of UK and, and the export out of, of European Union. If you look at also the other side, then you will have an import process as well, which, of course, will be uh, uh, very, very important for the companies to actually either do themselves or you use an expert if they can find one. Uh, and, and that advice they can, they can seek on, on many different sources today, which is the best way to go. But I would recommend everybody to do it. You know, it's a, it is a serious process. There's a simplified procedure, as many know, for import into UK the first six months in the phased approach that is now under the border operating model. Uh, the interesting thing with, with that is, of course, that even if you bring the goods in and avoid some of the queues, there will be queues at the border on the 1st of January. There's no doubt about that. Uh, even if you do that, you still have to be compliant enough to keep track of what you have brought in and do a supplementary declaration to customs within six months. And, and of course, doing that in itself is, is a very big undertaking and responsibility that could cost a lot if you don't have it in order. So I think that there's many things to think about. Also for Swedish companies, for instance, to look at not only their own preparations, but the counterparts, the stakeholders, the, tra the, the, the logistic company, the trader on the other side. Uh, they also have done their permissions. And when we talk about avoiding queues and avoiding the, the, uh, the first days of unheard of 
uh, panel before talked about this as well. We got to realize that this is the biggest custom change I've seen in my 36 years uh, in working in customs all around the world. It's one of the biggest trade flows in the world. There will be problems. There will be delays. Even if UK would have started four years ago preparing, there would have been problems. Maybe the problems would have sorted, be sorted out quicker, maybe in a few days. Now it will take a little bit longer because industry will, at the end of the day, take care of the problems that are there. Uh, and government is doing what it can with the 78 days to go to inform people. But we also know it's only 25% of the companies in the UK, approximately to several studies that has prepared so far. So use the time wisely. Uh, take a decision on, again, can I do it myself? Because I have to be able to do it. Take the legal responsibility of what I then uh, submit to government in both sides. And again, uh, is there anybody else that can help me? Seek help. Uh, there's still availability to do that. And I think uh, I would recommend everybody to take a, a really good look at not only their own preparations and, and a number of these issues. When we look at the company, which we've done, as I said, many, many times now, we have 60 different areas and questions we go through with the company. Not all of them are relevant for a small, medium-sized or a multinational. It depends on what type of industry they're in. But basically all of them you have to go through and you have to look at it uh, from that perspective. Uh, and it is a big change. There's going to be a, a lot of questions all along. And, and of course, this is a, a good initiative like we're having today, but they need more, there's more need, need for more uh, or, or both the information. But we do know now the border process in UK. We know the UCC, the Customs Legislation of European Union. So from a trade or customs perspective, you can actually prepare and do as much as you can to be ready on 1st of January, together with your own other partners than the the trader or company on the other side and, and also with the uh, professional service providers in between. Uh, they need to be able to answer the questions because otherwise they won't even, the goods will not, won't even get down to Dover or to, to, the, to the channel tunnel or same on the other side and will be, be stuck in queues. And of course, that is not what anybody wants. So um, prepare, prepare, prepare. And just a kind of a market intelligence question, if I may, before we bring in the audience for their questions. It's been said that there is a shortage of customs capacity, especially in the UK. So is it therefore the case that the rates that are kind of being charged in the market are going up because of that shortage of capacity or are we not seeing that yet? Well, we haven't seen that yet, but it, it, of course, it's a market economy. So, you know, that would be normally the reaction on it. And we'll have to see. Uh, but I think that uh, there are different ways to sort out the issue. There is a gap in the market on capacity. Uh, there are costs that will be uh, will also added on. But let's also see the opportunities here, because, you know, th there is a fact that UK will have now a, a new customs procedure in place. And of course, that also means that some of those SMEs that previously only traded with the EU because they didn't have that extra burden, uh, will now also get an opportunity if UK government and HMRC, Border Force and the others are doing the right things to actually prepare a, a process in two steps and three steps now that is better to also do exports to other countries than the European Union. Right. So there's always a, a, a positive to the negative and we should not always focus only on the problems we will see in the first month of, of, of next year, but also the opportunities that comes beyond that because otherwise we, we lose out the perspective. Great. Well, thank you, Lars. And um, I think that's, for me, the questions I have. Uh, we are able now to go to a Q&A with our audience members. So uh, if people do have questions, I understand that you'll be unmuted uh, by the powers that be, and you'll be able to ask your questions. So um, who do we have our first question from? Um, let me see. Uh, do we have a question from Mark in the audience? Let's have a look. Should we unmute Mark? Um, Apologies, bear with us. Yes, Mark, you're unmuted, go ahead. Well, if we can't get Mark, I'll read out his question. Um, so Mark's question is, uh, to everyone, based on your experience, how much sense does it make to set up a customs bonded warehouse in the UK? to consolidate goods coming out of a transit procedure in order to avoid customs clearance at the border? Would it facilitate the inbound flow of goods? I think that's a question for you, Lars. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is one of the ways you can actually uh, avoid some of the 
potential problems at the border by actually using the transit system. The UK uh, is now also by leaving the European Union a member of the transit convention. So it is possible to do with transit there. Uh, and it, well, I should also say then the bonded warehouse is actually <laughs> where the transit would end. But then they also meet, need to uh, apply for a authorized consignee uh, status, which means that they can also end the transit movement, which is basically going from A to B without passing the border uh, any any border formalities at the border, uh, and this is a this is one of the ways to solve the issues. Uh, again, there's also then uh, permits that needs to be there. And let me also underline that when we say sometimes there could be uh, border hustle and, and queues at the border, this is also the same with uh, applying for different type of statuses like authorized economic operator or transit or con uh, authorized consignee and consignor, so they can start transit. There's also queue there. So again. If this is a solution to think about, you should also put in an application for this as soon as possible. So HMRC actually can handle it in time. So you can start using that type of model. But it's one of the models actually that is recommended to do. There are costs involved with that as well. So that is something to consider. But uh, certainly transit and a bonded warehouse solution with authorized consignee status is one of the ways to avoid some of the problems or challenges at the border. Great stuff. Thank you, Lars. Um, we have another question from Trevor. Would Trevor like to come on and ask his question? Uh, we unmute Trevor. If not, I can ask the question. The floor is yours, Trevor. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, my question is really around um, the economic employer uh, concept that's coming into play and, and how that plays to the business travellers. Um, what kind of impact the panel see that having on business travel to Sweden and how, how UK businesses should prepare for that? Lucy, do you have a go at that one? Um, yeah, I would say that my, my knowledge is only coming into the UK. Um, I can say, so I can't give advice on Swedish law, which is essentially what that will be. Um, I would say that as of... Um, after after the transitional period, each individual country of the European Economic Area will have their own laws in terms of how UK citizens travel into that into the into those countries. So each country will be dealing with that under their own domestic legislation, and it will be totally separate. Um, so, you know, Sweden will have a different policy um, in terms of what um, a UK citizen can do as a visitor, or will whether they need a work permit to, to do activities. To, compared to Germany, France, all all countries will will be uh, will be treating this independently, and I have seen uh, essentially it will obviously each country now has those rules and that ability to make those decisions based on travellers from third third countries such as the US or or, or or any other country outside the EU. So you will see, I think, a, a very varied ability of what um, citizens of the UK can do when they travel into Europe, depending on which country they go to. Does that answer your question? Do you have a follow up? Cool. If not, um, it remains for me today. I need to leave. It's 11.30. I have to go and do some reporting and writing, but I will now pass back over to Peter, who will carry on this session. If you do have more questions, please do keep asking them. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for everyone for joining this panel. And uh, thank you everyone to the chamber for having me on. And uh, yeah, I'll pass back over to you, Peter. Thank you. And, and first of all, thanks, Joe. I know you have to leave. I know. The timing couldn't be better or worse for this um, <laughs> from your uh, point of view. So we really appreciate you joining us today. You're very welcome. Yeah, fantastic having a real Brexit expert. Now go do your 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 real job um, <laughs> uh, you know, covering um, uh, the negotiations today. Um, super thanks. Thanks also to all of our speakers and panelists today um, for sharing your expertise. Uh, and I think a, a good summary is that things will change. It will not be business as usual, um, uh, whether we hoped or thought uh, it would be. Uh, and I sort of uh, take with me the last what you said about there will be problems, um, but we also know that business has this unique uh, uh, sort of ability to adapt. Um, but I, I keep hearing Jonas from Scandi Kitchen saying as well, yeah, maybe in Q2. <laughs> So, so there will be a bit of pain uh, initially. Uh, and the key naturally is to be as prepared as possible, something we have reiterated over the last couple of years, just do as much as you can. But we all know that there are some things that you can't do 
until you have uh, uh, sort of the script at hand. And I think Lucy bringing immigration, which is an issue for us, uh, um, it's sort of at the starting point. We don't really know where it's going to go over the next couple of years. We know that things might change. There might be other opportunities, but at the moment it's a bit tough uh, to analyze it, uh, and especially if you're a smaller business. Um, hopefully we'll know more tomorrow, who knows, uh, or in the coming days as uh, things progress uh, with regards to the negotiations, and we all anxiously wait as we have for the last couple of years. Uh, but lastly, I want to say um, a huge thanks to our sponsors. Uh, the Swedish Embassy, uh, KGH Customs and TMF Group. Thank you very much for partnering with us uh, today and our fellow Chambers of Commerce. Now, do stay on everyone if you do have questions that you want to pose to Lucy, Lars or Maria. Uh, I'm sure they'll oblige and um, uh, it'll be semi-private uh, as you'll be in a room with everyone else, but it's a good opportunity to, to pick their brains uh, in the last minute uh, Q&A. So thanks everyone for joining us. And I'm sure we'll be discussing this for months and years to come. Lars, if you do not mind, um, Mark had a question for you, for you regarding the customs before. He has a follow-up question. Um, I'm going to read it out loud for you, though, because um, he seems to have some um, problems with his mic, if that is okay. Yeah. Um, so the question is, are there border checks expected by HMRC or will there be an ease on border checks in the beginning? Yeah, it's a good question, but because uh, government has the official policy is that there shouldn't be more border checks uh, from 1st of January than there have been in the past. So they're not increasing the border checks, but obviously they have the ob ability to do border checks also from 1st of January. And uh, it's also said that even if somebody is using the simplified procedure that is uh, now in, uh, in a phased approach of the border, model that has been presented, meaning that you can go through in a simplified way and then do a complementary supplementary declaration six months later, then you still, if you were selected for an inspection or a control, you will be, uh, you will have to submit the, the data and the declaration anyway. So even using a simplified procedure, they need to be a knowledge and competence and a compliance model in the company to make sure that you have the data needed for a declaration if HMRC would actually ask for one. So I think the, the answer to the question is that uh, I don't think UK will increase the uh, inspections and controls made today and most customs administrations uh, in Europe uh, including the European Union and UK are doing uh, approximately one to two percent of, of, of checks and controls so I think that's the uh, that's the amount or lower than that that we can expect from the beginning but there will be controls and inspections and that is something that every trader needs to be prepared on just like today. Thank you so much, Lars. Um, Mark, I hope that did answer uh, your question. If not, uh, please please write to us again. Um, Mark is saying now, thank you, Lars, in the chat. So hopefully <laughs> that did answer any questions. If there's anyone who has um, a question that is still um, left here in the room, please feel free, feel free to use the chat or the, the Q&A function. We'll be hanging on for, for a little, little while longer. Um, we did have a question from a gentleman called Mikael Johansson, who was asking about personal data. I know that we have said that if there are questions that we don't feel comfortable um, answering, we won't be doing that. But I thought I'll put it forward and we'll see if we can do it together. Um, the question is, can you elaborate a bit on any limitations to exchange personal data in case of a no deal? Mr. Uh, Anna has any advice on that? It's not my field, so. I'll leave that for my colleagues. I can maybe bring up shortly. Uh, so yes, as uh, been mentioned also in the previous panel, that uh, the data uh, transfer is uh, is uh, going to be a big issue unless there is a, a document which was put into regulation. So we need to think here every time the third country or the outside of the EU country, every time we transfer data. And uh, to the very limited uh, extent, the withdrawal agreement uh, touches the, the, the uh, data protection and uh, data transfer, but that is obviously not enough for the businesses uh, to uh, function in full capacity. 
So um, right now, uh, where the UK stands is because the UK has uh, been uh, part of the EU, uh, the UK is compliant to the EU regulations at the moment, but um, the adequacy uh, decision is to be made to uh, ensure that uh, the same uh, stands uh, in the future and uh, maybe one of the, uh, unless this happens, uh, one of the uh, smaller steps is uh, revision of the uh, subprocessors you're using uh, on, at each level, the um, types of data you are transferring because it will be payroll data which will be affected. So all your employees that will be accounting data, uh, for example, from a Swedish uh, in, uh, this, from Swedish accounting perspective, the accounting data should be stored in Sweden or at least in the European Union. And that means that the special uh, provisions need to be put in place to secure that uh, or the accounting needs to be moved to the uh, to, to a European country if it's stored uh, in the UK. And um, the, unless uh, an, another layer for that is the addition, perhaps additional uh, data processing agreements should be put in with the subprocessors you are using uh, in the uh, from the EU uh, with the with the UK. So uh, we, we cover it in case of the decision of the adequacy means that. that the measures are not considered to be adequate enough to protect. But the general uh, piece of advice here is to, again, to map and evaluate and follow up with the, what, uh, whatever update would come uh, in terms of agreements here. I hope this, this helps a bit. I do hope that that answered Mikael's questions as well. Um, otherwise, again, please use the, the chat. You can always get in contact um, after this uh, webinar or event. Um, I think that that seems to be it when it comes to the Q&A at the moment. Um, Lars, I do have a little special request for you, though. Uh, we have a gentleman here called Daniel. Um, he is um, calling in or dialing in from Sveriges Radio, which is the National Swedish Radio. Um, he has asked to uh, pose you a question and to be able to do it in Swedish, if he may. Um, so anyone uh, on this call that might not be that familiar with the Swedish language yet, um, please feel free to log off. We thank you a lot for joining us, of course. Um, but Lars, obviously this would probably be on record if, if I understand it correctly. I just wanted to double check with you first that that is obviously okay. Um, yeah. Lucy, Maria, um, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you want to stay and practice your Swedish, please feel free to do so. Um, otherwise, I thank you a lot. Um, Daniel, I think uh, we are bringing you forward now. Um, and uh, we'll see if we can uh, if we can unmute you. Um, do you hear me like that, perhaps? Daniel, we do hear you very well. Thank you, Lars. Can you hear Daniel? Yes, I, I can. Oh, that is great. Cool. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm a correspondent for Sveriges Radio here in in London. Okay. Följer den här frågan noga. Och det här kommer bli en liten sammanfattning av det du har pratat om här under de här timmarna lite grann att få förklara vad de största förändringarna blir och om det blir ett avtal eller inte. Liksom. Så vi kan bara börja där. Om du, hur viktigt det är, ja, hur, hur viktigt tycker du att det är att det blir ett, ett avtalsreglerat förhållande mellan Storbritannien och EU efter årsskiftet? Ur tull- och handelssynpunkt är det viktigt att det blir ett avtal och jag är optimist. Jag tror fortfarande att det finns en chans att det kan bli ett handelsavtal då mellan de två parterna. Därför bägge parterna är intresserade av det. Och det viktiga med det är att det kommer då att, att naturligtvis minska kostnaderna för näringslivet på bägge sidor. Både svenska och EU-företag, naturligtvis det brittiska företag också. Men det är bara en del av kostnaderna och det måste man komma ihåg. Att lite som det ibland eh, framställs så är det liksom eh, en jättestor skillnad. Det är det inte. Utan den stora skillnaden är egentligen att vi får en tullprocedur. Det blir en tullgräns mellan eh, EU och Storbritannien. Och det innebär att man måste uppfylla de regler som vi har satt tillsammans för handel eh, med ett tredje land. Vilket innebär då att man måste lämna tulldeklarationer i båda riktningarna. Man måste veta exakt vad det är för klassificering av varan enligt dem 
speciella modeller och metoder som finns. Men det är klart att det är en av kostnaderna och den andra kostnaden är att det kan vara en tullavgift eller en skatt på toppen av det. Och ett, ett frihandelsavtal skulle ju då för många av varorna eller eventuellt i ett bästa av lägena i alla varor ta bort den ena delen, det vill säga skatten och tullen på de här transporterna mellan Storbritannien och EU. Så, och och de, de värsta, om du kan lista de värsta konsekvenserna av om det inte skulle bli ett avtal för svenska företag eller brittiska företag som har som exporterat till Sverige till exempel, vad skulle det bli? Ja. Det blir ju då att man får en, en relativ hög kostnad först för att överhuvudtaget göra den här förflyttningen på budget eftersom det inte är fri rörlighet längre utan man måste deklarera det på bägge sidor av transporten. Så när man lämnar Storbritannien till, Sverige, till EU och när man lämnar från EU till Storbritannien. Bägge de här måste man då lägga på. Och det är klart att är det inget frihandelsavtal då som ytterligare reglerar att det är tull och skatt så kan man ju då få, eh, kommer man då i Storbritannien att backa tillbaka till eh, WTO, så alltså Världshandelsorganisationens eh, olika eh, system. Och där kan det då bli allt mellan eh, 2, 3, 4, 5 procent upp till 15, 20 procent tull på varan också. Då får man ju de här två konsekvenserna att både det kostar mer att göra själva eh, så att säga exporten och importen men också att man får en avgift på toppen. Och det ihop kanske tar bort hela marginalen på varan. Och det skulle då innebära att det inte är lönsamt längre att bedriva den här typen av handel och man måste hitta andra alternativ. Så att det finns ju ett sätt att se till att man, man skyddar sig mot det här på bästa möjliga sätt. Att man förbereder sig så att det inte händer. Det är fortfarande 78 dagar som man har på sig att göra det här. Men det här är allvarliga konsekvenser för många stora företag. Och som vi vet har det ju bland annat föranlett att stora multinationella företag har flyttat hela sin verksamhet på ett eller annat sätt. Eller då, bland annat biltillverkare och andra. Så stora är de här konsekvenserna om man inte har förberett sig korrekt. Tror du att det skulle menligt påverka handel mellan Sverige och Storbritannien om det inte blir ett avtalsreglerat förhållande? Det beror ju lite på vilka varor det är. För vissa varor kommer det ha en lägre tull eller ingen tull alls och fast det inte blir ett avtal medan andra kommer det att ha en väldigt hög tull. Så att det, kan påverka, eller det kommer att påverka förhållandet. Men man kan också vända på det här att vi i Sverige är, är ganska väl organiserade företagen är i normalfallet ha bra koll på sina, på sina olika rutiner och så vidare. Och förbereder vi oss bättre än andra konkurrenter så kan det ju bli en konkurrensfördel också på Storbritanniens marknad. Att det finns tyska eller franska företag som inte har förberett sig så väl och därmed inte klara av den här omställningen blir för dyrt för dem helt enkelt. Och då kan det skapa möjligheter med. Men det är väldigt viktigt att man går igenom de frågor som finns. Och det kan man gå till kommerskollegium som myndighet eller handelskammaren som man har här eller till privata sektorn som KGH som jag jobbar på. Så får man reda på det och få hjälp med de här olika bedömningarna. Och slutligen, alltså vi säger så här, om det blir då ett avtal här de här närmaste dagarna, men vi förflyttar oss fram till 1 januari då 2021, alltså om 78 dagar. Ja. Vad ser du framför dig i Dover och i hamnarna på ömsesidor av, av kanalen? Ja, det kommer först och främst att bli kaos. Det kommer att bli en del kaos i början här. Därför att det här är en av de största tullföreningarna man har gjort i, i någonsin. Eh, flödena är, är en, ett av de största flödena i världen. Så det är klart att även om man hade från Storbritanniens sida startat förbereda sig för tre år sedan så hade det blivit problem när man gör övergången. Nu kommer problemen att bli något längre och ta längre tid och därmed bli mer kostsamma för företagen. På grund av att man helt enkelt har haft för kort tid på sig att förbereda sig på rätt sätt och det finns fortfarande en del saker som inte är klara. Men det innebär ju bara återigen att man som företagare måste ta sitt eget ansvar då att, att försöka undvika att hamna i de värsta köerna, stå stilla, inte ha förberett sig så man har rätt dokumentation så att ens partner på andra sidan också har gjort sina förberedelser. Så att man gör alla de här sakerna då för att säkerställa att man kommer så, så väl ur det här som, som möjligt. Sen kommer industrin efter ett visst tid, efter några veckor, eh, hur lång tid det kan ta vet vi inte, att, att börja rätta sig efter det här naturligtvis och då hitta sätten hur man kommer förbi. Så det är ett övergående problem i första läget men kostnadsnivån kommer att öka på alla varor och det kommer att påverka svenska företag. Bättre att förbereda, det är bättre är det. Ser du, ser du någon fördel med, med Brexit? Alltså, vad, vad skulle fördelen kunna bli? Nej, men det är ju klart att, att för de, de enda två liksom stora fördelarna för om man tar man Storbritanniens eh, synpunkt så kommer de ju införa en ny tullprocedur och en ny handelsprocedur som 
förhoppningsvis för dem och deras företag då så att säga eh, gör att det blir lättare att handla inte bara med ja, men det blir lite svårare med EU-länder så blir det för de 50 procent av handeln de har med resten av världen något lättare. Så det är klart det kan ju kompensera för dem. För EUs del är det naturligtvis mer komplicerat för det blir dyrare att handla med en av våra största handelspartner. För Sverige är ju Storbritannien är de största handelspartners vi har. Så att det är klart att eh, fördelarna där kan man möjligtvis lite långsiktigt vara att om Storbritannien lyckas med sin strategi global Britain och, och verkligen bli det där landet som ligger först när det gäller handel. Då kan de sätta press på EU att också förbättra och förenkla sina rutiner för företagen så det blir enklare att göra export och import. Men då pratar vi lite längre fram i tiden så att säga på EU-sidan. Så EU har mer att förlora än Storbritannien just nu, det är alldeles klart. Ja, det, jag, 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 jag ber om ursäkt att ställa en fråga till. Nej, ja. ibland, ibland upplever jag också det att man säger, alltså EU säger hela tiden att nej, pressen ligger på Storbritannien bara att liksom, eh, komma, att, att komma på ett avtal. Men det, du säger att det, det, egentligen kommer det kosta mer för många EU-länder än Storbritannien. Eh, jag kan utveckla det lite grann. Alltså, fattar inte EU det? Eller vad, vad är, vad, är det mer förhandlingstaktik nej, men, att man säger så? Men... Man ska väl komma ihåg då att det finns ju ett antal andra områden då att ett handelsavtal skulle vi nog kunna teckna nu under det här rådsmötet som finns i Bryssel just nu. Men det är klart att det finns ju då flera andra områden. Fisket är ett område till exempel där EU har mycket att förlora och har möjligheter att få ut lite positivt av det här istället från, från, som i förhållande till Storbritannien. Samma sak när det gäller det man kallar level playing fields, det vill säga att man ska ha samma regler så det gäller statligt stöd till företag och annat. Och det är klart att EU är ju orolig här att, att man ska få ett stort singa på precis runt knuten eh, som alltså är ledande i handel och så vidare och då därmed också kan sätta press på EUs möjligheter och vårt möjligheter att, att handla med, med Asien och med Sydamerika och Afrika och alla nya kontinenter som kommer. Så på det sättet kan man väl säga att samtidigt får man väl då för att nyansera bilden så att Storbritannien har ett stort åtagande här. De måste lyckas då för, för det här ska bli faktiskt För de tappar ju trots allt en del av sin marknad i EU så att det blir dyrare för brittiska företag att handla med EU. Så att den måste kompenseras med handel för resten av världen. Gör man det då har Storbritannien så att säga, en möjlighet och det är vad politikerna tror på för närvarande i, 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 i så att säga, nuvarande regering. Att man ska lyckas röra sig snabbare med handeln än vad EU kan som är en det är en stor koloss när det gäller förhandlingar och annat. Tack så mycket. Ingen fara. Och jag glömde att sätta på kameran här. Jag har inte på den här kameran. Du kan gärna du kan höra av dig. Du hittar ju min, min adress på nätet om du ja. har ytterligare frågor. Thank you very much everybody. Thank you so much, Daniel. And um, I got a little message from Maria here that said that um, you could add shortly. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I'll do, uh, I think, to, uh, to the Daniel's uh, question. Uh, well, Dr. Daniel uh, has left. Uh, just wanted to mention to, addition to what uh, Lars was saying, that uh, uh, it's not only the payments and the, uh, uh, the reporting per se, but also from the forms and registrations from the original uh, perspective. The uh, effect is also that, uh, say, if you have a trader, for example, the, uh, uh, who is uh, uh, working with uh, e-commerce with uh, uh, the European Union. Uh, again, uh, in case of the uh, no uh, agreement in place, uh, this, uh, the UK trader will need to reach each of the European uh, countries separately to register for the VAT. Uh, and that might uh, impact the decision whether this, the, if the customers are in the uh, in the various European countries, whether he whether this trader actually is going to go to these country, uh, countries and deliver the goods uh, and the services in there. And uh, uh, the uh, decision making for these processes is actually uh, much short, shorter. So this, uh, I believe, it's uh, end of October for some of the uh, procedures to be starting to uh, be put in place. So not even the January threshold we are having here. Thank you, Maria, for that. Um, I don't believe that we have any further questions at the moment. But I think, um, as Lars uh, Lars mentioned at the at the end, 
um, if there's anyone who has more specific questions that might not be suitable for this format, um, please do get in contact either with us here at the Swedish Chamber of Commerce, uh, or I'm sure that Lars, Lucy and Maria are happy to connect um, in a different way, um, if you don't mind. Um, Oh, no, now we do get, are getting more questions in. Oh, well, I shouldn't say, oh, no. Um, she said, this is fantastic. Um, Daniel actually has another question, if, if, if that is okay for everyone. And Daniel, maybe we could even break, try to bring me on camera this time. Um, bear with us. We're just trying to sort the, the technicals here in the background. Daniel, I think that you should be able to speak now. We're going to ask you to put on your camera too. Yeah, Otherwise, feel free, I'm free to. to I'm trying to do that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm made for radio, not TV, so that's why I, I didn't have my camera on. So. Um, do you hear me now? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. No, I was just uh, wondering uh, uh, if the panel could uh, ask to, 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 to um, develop a little bit on the following question: Why do you think it's so difficult for the Two parts here to, to 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 come to an agreement. What is the why is it so difficult? Is it politics or is it actually the the the, the questions or the issues that are so difficult to, to solve? Is it politics or the other thing? Feel free to say what you what you think. Uh, I can I can start. It's, it's a little bit of a political question though, and I normally don't answer political questions being a, in, in the position I am. But. Um, you're, you're right in the sense that I think the most, first of all, I think there was an underestimation of how difficult it is to, loo, to leave a customs union, a customs territory uh, for, for several, several years. That was one of the big, big problems, that the integration that we actually have reached with the single market is so, so deep and so uh, in, uh, integrated that it's, it actually is very difficult to leave it. But then I think that from it, where we are right now, the standpoint is, is quite clear that it's a political issue. It's it's about you know the the gains and the, uh, and what who will gain most out of a negotiation. That that is the issue right now. It's not technical issues themselves. The technical issues are complicated, as we have talked about here. With right amount of time, we would have solved all of them. Now, of course, if there hasn't been for the political process enough time, then I think it, uh, there will still be technical issues as well. But I also think those will be sorted and be, will be solved over time. So, so for me, I, I think that uh, my view is that obviously uh, these are, are, are very highly political questions. Um, and, and that's to some extent the difficulty of negotiating them as well but it started up with the fact that both parties were not prepared for how how big this could be because it's never happened before um from the immigration side i would say it's entirely political from from my viewpoint um and i think this was evidenced by the fact that i think one of the very first um issues that was discussed when negotiations began years ago was a reassurance that each individual you know, UK citizens in Europe would be guaranteed a status and, and reciprocated here. And even that was not agreed upon immediately. Yeah, that, that could have been something that was resolved very simply, but the negotiations started badly, I think from, from that point of view in saying, well, we're not going to, it, the UK could have just turned around and said, of course, any U EU citizen living here is, is welcome to stay without exception. But they were waiting to see what the EU would say about UK citizens, and it became a bargaining point right at the beginning. I think, though, having said that, as I've said uh, earlier, the immigration issues have, have, to, have not entirely, but have pretty much been determined and decided. Um, so I think at this point, it's more perhaps that evidence that it wasn't actually that complicated, um, because you know, unlike Lars and, and Maria, the immigration side is a little less um, a little less complicated in my view, and therefore ha most things have been resolved. I mean, there are still there are still individual um, individual issues um, which haven't quite quite got there, but generally, I think we're in a position where everyone knows what what's going to be happening uh, at the end of the year. Um, and actually, while while I'm talking, I just wanted to pick up on one separate point that Lars made. Um, quite early on when we were talking before about opportunities that arise um, from, from these negative, ne negative issues. Um, one thing also that employers should bear in mind that the 
skilled worker license that I spoke of earlier, which is currently called tier two, that is actually becoming much easier um, to sponsor workers under for all citizens. So not just Europeans, but your US citizens, your you know, Indian citizens. Um, there are various things that are changing about that visa type, um, one of which is the skill level is being reduced from a degree level down to high school, um, A level, and the abolishment of the cap of the number of tier two visas that you can obtain, um, and the abolishment of the um, having to advertise the role to prove that there are no UK workers that are available. So as I say, there are positive things coming out of this, which, you know, European citizens may not feel positive, but for an employer, things should become easier when you are um, the, the trade off with not being able to just bring in um, European workers is the trade off is that it will be easier to bring non European workers to the UK. Yeah, it's um, sometimes I think people forget that I mean, French fishermen are not to or could be very angry if they don't get what they want. And that, that puts a lot of internal pressure on Macron and also here in Britain. I mean, Boris Johnson has to deliver for the uh, for the Brexiteers, basically. And if he doesn't, you know, if he gives in too much, it's going to be a tough ride for him, I guess. So mm -hmm. political issue to me now is very big. And I think that the the changes to that skilled worker visa are politically driven as well. You know, there was, as we know, it was hardly 100% vote in favour of Brexit in the UK. Um, and I think I have seen over the last few years very much a softening of the approach of, of course, we should be welcoming um, skilled workers to the UK. Um, and so I, I think that the changes that we're going to see in the future to that skilled worker visa category are in some ways a result of politically driven in that a refocus as to the, you know, the recognition that skilled workers are certainly the, the, the migrants that want to be encouraged to the UK. I also think that the, the COVID-19 corona crisis pandemic has played into this. So obviously, this is a huge matter for all European countries and the United Kingdom as well. And of course, the pressure is even more on to, to deliver on areas where government can deliver. Uh, and I think the Prime Minister is really eager to get a trade facilitation, uh, trade uh, agreement with the European Union, just like EU needs it for their business to at least not add on to problems we've had with the coronavirus. From my side, I agree with uh, Lucy. Uh, it's, uh, from my view, is also majorly uh, politically driven decision and overlapping with the lack of knowledge in the first place uh, among the uh, common people. It's not a secret that one of the most Googled questions uh, right after the voting was, what is the EU? So, which uh, made it much easier to trade the question in and uh, help people make the decision. And um, yeah, as the, 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 now the, the, the COVID part, of course, they, they put the discussions a little bit aside and uh, does not, which does not help uh, putting the decision through to, uh, to actually settle in place uh, various items which need to be tackled. And many questions which were covered under one umbrella called the EU are now falling under the reign of many, many, many items and areas in the business which uh, the companies now need to think and put into place in order to keep driving their business smoothly. Thank you all for, for interesting answers. Thank you so much. Thank and you, thank Daniel. Wonderful, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in the meanwhile, we have had one last question coming through. I hope you don't mind if any one of our panelists need to rush off. Please do not let us uh, let us hold you for too long. We appreciate that you're staying on. Um, we do have a question here from uh, Pavel. Um, Pavel, can you hear us? And um, are you able to use your microphone? Yes. Hello, everybody. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we can. Uh, hello. Well, Zoom works perfectly. That's a relief. Um, so just a general question to, to the panel. And, and um, um, I mean, how is uh, how's everybody's business uh, been preparing for Brexit? What steps have been taken? Uh, 
be interesting to know uh, what steps have been taken to kind of prepare for this uh, um, end result, which we know is coming. But um, but uh, just to hear something about that. Yeah, yeah. Let me start. And uh, no, no. It's it's quite clear, as I said before, that there are companies that have prepared. Uh, I don't think that there's any company that have prepared enough or, or as much as they could. And, and that's that's natural. That's reasonable. But there are studies done in UK, as I said before, that only 25 to maximum 30 percent of companies that are uh, having is going to be affected by, by this uh, actually have prepared at all. And I think the numbers we've seen from some other countries as well is are basically the same or lower. Uh, and obviously, this is an issue because even if you have as a company prepared as much as you can, you still need to make sure that your your freight forwarder, your transporter, your your counterpart in the other country also have prepared enough. Because otherwise, you will still be stuck with all of those who are not prepared enough. And of course, this is one of the issues that we do know that when you, a, a customs border appear in a place where it hasn't been before, there's no reason why you would actually have the same type of procedures we do have on our outer borders today. But there's a there's a risk, of course, because they, the Channel Tunnel and the Dover Calais, for instance, the Roro uh, uh, borders are, are extremely fast today. And it's very difficult to cope with any difficulties that actually appear. So I think that companies have prepared to some extent. I think the prolonging of, of a different type of, of uh, um, um, the 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 time several times have been prolonged or delayed it hasn't really helped. We haven't seen that companies prepare more just because there is a delay. Uh, on the contrary, some of them have said, "I started preparing for March, and and you know now I'm not going to do anything more because I'll wait and see, see what happens. Maybe it's going to go away. Maybe it's going to be delayed again." And I think that hasn't helped the preparations either, which is again totally natural because how can you invest for something that you don't know is going to happen or not? But now we do know that it's going to happen. There will be no more delay. Uh, we know what the border procedures and many of the other regulatory frameworks around immigration and, and other areas as well look like. So now it is really a responsibility to prepare. And I think that even though there's a little time, there's a lot of things that can be done. But in general, we are not prepared enough. That's my summary of it. All right, thank you. Well, yeah. I'm sorry, Marie, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, if if I understand the question right, you were asking about uh, our preparation uh, in the uh, for from TMF, uh, for for TMF as TMF is a, a global company. We are uh, having uh, the the European offices are less affected, and the question probably would be about our uh, TMF offices. And uh, in general uncertainty, all we can do here is all. Uh, what all other businesses can do uh, in order to get prepared uh, to the best of the outcome, uh, including the, this favorable one. And uh, our TMF offices uh, uh, in the UK uh, have developed uh, uh, a comprehensive planning tool uh, which uh, considers what, scenario, uh, what scenarios um, the team uh, can work towards. Uh, in the light of various guidances which are uh, getting discussed and uh, uh, issued uh, on the uh, uh, ongoing basis and what's in and how the scenarios can impact our business and the overview goes as far as no deal scenarios and uh, which areas should uh, can be tackled and what the level impact of the impact uh, is uh, on each of these areas and uh, the Planner is a live uh, instrument and the work uh, done uh, is uh, quite impressive and keeping up to date uh, and kept by today, uh, up to date by various uh, stakeholders in TMF. And the areas covered uh, uh, for our company, uh, for instance, it's a product review, uh, it's licenses and passporting, it's HR questions, IT matters, uh, the data protection matters that's already uh, been brought up, obviously client communications and others and others. So uh, on, on, on general, the evaluation and keeping an eye on regulatory updates, this is the, the maximum that uh, uh, at the moment the companies can do in, in this the unknown of unknown situations and just follow up. 
And if you ask for KGH, of course, we, we are prepared because this is what we do. Uh, we are customs and border experts, so uh, we are helping others. And, and uh, I have myself had had uh, eight times in the parliament with the House of Commons and House of Lords as giving testimony about how this can be solved. So obviously we are, we are prepared to help as many as possible. But as I said, it is it's a lot of companies that needs help for the moment. And uh, there is a capacity uh, issue in the market of actually being able to help people. But, you know, if you call any of us, I think, on the call, we will do whatever we can to try and help. Thank you. And obviously supporting the clients and constantly consulting the clients and uh, picking up on their issues. And I think I think from the immigration side, I'd say that most in, most in the clients that I work with are uh, as prepared as they can be. Um, given that actually nothing changes on January 1st in terms of their current employees. Um, and I think COVID has probably taken um, everyone's attention elsewhere for, for most of this year. Um, you know, why, sadly, why worry about your employees that you may need to recruit in 2021 when actually in 2020 you're struggling to, to retain the ones and keep, keep in employment the ones you have. Um, I would say that as well, the Home Office have been quite, they've now issued all the information about the new visa system and the skilled worker license. Um, that only came out in the summer and really it was only last, about two weeks ago, they started to really publish all of the, the, the information needed to get that, to get that license for people that don't. So I would say most large organizations are, are pretty well covered because they will already have a tier two license in place, which will convert automatically on January 1st. I think the companies that may struggle are ones that are quite small companies who don't have a, a license at the moment and don't know that they'll need one. They think they won't need one until February comes around and they find a really good candidate who is um, Swedish and then suddenly realise actually but, but it hasn't moved to the UK yet. So there are, I think for now they're as prepared as they can be, but I say I would encourage, um, I would encourage all companies to just have a think about are they likely to need a skilled worker license in the future? Because it's certainly something that they could consider getting now and getting it in place so that there's a smooth um, transition later in 2021. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, Lars unfortunately had to, to leave us now to run off to the to the next meeting. Um, as I mentioned again, please get in contact if you have further or more specific questions um, for any of our panelists or if SSE can be of any help or support. Um, thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Thank you to our sponsors once again, and uh, we very much hope that you will be joining us um, at another event um, in the near future. Um, I'm wishing you all a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.